Welcome to ASRM Today Book Review, a podcast that interviews the authors who dive deeper into the field of reproductive medicine. I'm Jeffrey Hayes. Today on the book review, we are talking about reproductive ethics in clinical practice, preventing, initiating, and managing pregnancy and delivery. Here to discuss the book are the editors of the book. First up, Dr. Julie Kaur, who's an associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at University of Chicago Medicine, and also Professor Katie Watson, who is associate professor of medical education, medical social sciences, and obstetrics and gynecology at Northwestern Medicine. Welcome both of you to ASRM Today Book Review. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. I want to start off, it's kind of become a tradition here, not only on the book review, but also on the regular ASRM Today podcast. For first timers, I I always feel like sharing our experiences help listeners and also ourselves sort of get in the headspace. So this question is for both of you, and I'll start with with Dr. Kaur. Um, Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds. How how, how did you how did you get interested in reproductive medicine? Oh, (laughs) reproductive medicine, or (laughs) uh, that goes like way way back. Um, I would say to my undergraduate days. I knew that I was interested in medicine from, you know, high school. So that that was something certainly was modeled by my parents. But initially, I thought I wanted to go into like more behavioral health. But then in undergrad, I went to Oberlin College, which was very politically oriented, um, uh, socially oriented. And I realized kind of during coursework and other um, experiences that reproductive health as a a profession was a way to combine both my kind of more scientific interests and my um, social um, commitments and and kind of the things that really moved me um, as an individual um, and thinking about kind of the the greater good. So, you know, I, I pretty much knew coming out of of undergrad and starting uh, medical school that that reproductive health was the direction that I wanted to go. For me, you know, I, I do a lot of work with medical students um, and I tell them when they're thinking about what specialty to go into, that they need to really figure out what lights the fire in their belly, um, what's going to sustain them for a lifetime. And to me, being involved in um, in matters both personal, but also so kind of the bigger social picture. Um, that's certainly what, what um, you know, lights my belly and keeps me sustained in, in what I do. And Professor Watson, how about you? Well, I'm a lawyer and uh, in law school, I had a fellowship in reproductive freedom. I was always interested in the relationship between bodies and the state, the patient perspective of when the government could tell you what you can and can't do with your body in all sorts of realms at the beginning of life, end of life, sexuality. Um, So I always had that patient perspective interest, but in law school, I, uh, because that fellowship did an internship at Montfiore hospital in the ethics and obstetrics unit. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing marriage of my interests. And then when I was a public defender for death row inmates, I was working with the psychiatrist putting together on, in habeas proceedings, putting together intergenerational portraits of mental illness and sexual abuse and um, substance abuse and other things, social histories. But I volunteered, I was trained at San Francisco General as a doula. Um, they had a program for lay women from the community to come and assist as volunteers low-income women without partners. And I thought, gosh, delivering by yourself would be the loneliest thing in the world. So I attended a good number of births. I needed some life in my life doing death penalty work in San Francisco. And so between those experiences, I kind of adopted a, a became fascinated with the medical perspective as well. And um, after some time at Legal Aid, did a fellowship at the McLean Center at University of Chicago in clinical medical ethics Um, And then a fellowship at Northwestern in medical humanities. And that brought all my, I would be a terrible doctor, science, math, not my jam. But I went to law school. I always call it blood and guts law, which is different than paper and money law. If you want something done with your corporation or your real estate, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, If you want to talk about the death penalty, taking someone off a ventilator or getting an abortion, I'm your lady. Um, So for me, uh, clinical ethics and medical ethics brings together these patients' rights issues, these larger social issues, and realizing that 
you know, when the nice person in the long white coat is behind closed doors, that's where power lies. And you can win all the lawsuits or pass all the statutes you want. But uh, if we don't have a cultural agreement, an ethical agreement about what is good and right in those moments, patients lose. Um, so medical education is really important to me too. And I would like to say you would make a great doctor. Professor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mess up all your prescriptions. Uh, I have no special <laughs> relations, but I'm a really good doula. I don't do well, it I, anymore. That's what, that's what I want to ask you, Professor. Walter. I've never met anyone who, who is a doula. How, how, how did that, how did that happen? Or how does it happen? How does someone become a doula? Yes. Well, Julie can tell you about this too. There are so many routes, but um, I just happened to, I, I, I was friends with a physician at San Francisco general who was doing HIV work, who told me about this training program that they needed volunteers. And I was like, I am in because I just love, you know, lawyers, we win you the right to give birth or have your abortion or get your REI. And then we walk away. And I always wanted to stay. <laughs> so for me, it was a wonderful opportunity to be in the room and see, you know, what's the point of all this legal work is these moments so people can just live their lives. And I'm the dork who I was very into the babies, but I was the one at the beginning who's like, show me the placenta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Women make a whole nother internal organ. That's just temporary. You know, I was so interested in every aspect. And I remember going to my first C-section with a teenager. I wasn't trained to be with people in C-sections, but things weren't going well. And she needed a C-section. I remember her holding my hand and we'd met a lot before and saying, okay, we're doing this. And me thinking we are um, and witnessing a C-section with no preparation. And I'm supposed to translate to her what's happening. So it, it, I, I do not fancy myself a clinician, but I, I think those experiences give me more empathy for the clinicians and the students I work with and, and the incredible challenge of their roles and the privilege and the stakes. And it's interesting, you know, um, Katie and I, like our paths have kind of intertwined even before we knew each other. Um, so, it, you know, kind of thematically, um, if, you know, uh, if not experientially, I, I've done quite a bit of research around doula support in pregnancy experiences outside of childbirth. And so um, certainly, you know, in terms of training opportunities, there are, you know, people who go into the, the area of doula support with more formal training. There are courses and um, you can get a certificate um, in doula training, but they're also kind of more um, like lay doulas who, who, who um, don't necessarily go through all of the, the more rigorous training, but it's really, you know, I think people um, in, in all aspects of pregnancy um, deserve and, um, and oftentimes need support. And um, when those people aren't, they are necessarily in their, you know, in their day-to-day um, -day life. It's a, a great opportunity to provide some needed support. I'm hearing to some some very key words here about support and being there. And I even extended out towards empathy as well. So I want to ask you both, this is a, it's a collection of writings. Was there an inspiration for the book? How did this process start? Yeah. So I can, I can certainly speak to that. Katie, mentioned the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, um, and that is based here at the University of Chicago, and it's led by Dr. Mark Siegler, who's um, really one of the uh, preeminent uh, clinical medical ethicists in, in the country, and I've had the good fortune of working with him. He was my professor when I was a medical student here at the University of Chicago, and now I have the great privilege and pleasure of co-directing the first year medical school uh, ethics class that I took as a medical student in my first year. So, under his, you know, guidance and, and directorship, the McLean Center has created this, you know, pretty formidable fellowship program. So I also completed the fellowship at the McLean Center and I'm part of the center, um, one of the assistant directors. And several years ago, I uh, wrote to Dr. Siegler and said, you know, every year for I think at that point it had been at least 30 years, the center had put together a year-long seminar. So every week, a leading expert, either local or national and sometimes international, um, speaks along a theme for the year. All right, so the, the themes have been transplant ethics, medical education ethics. So, you know, uh, uh, many, many different topics, but there had never been a reproductive ethics series. 
And so I wrote kind of a proposal feeling very strongly that obviously, number one, this is an important area. Number two, it's so rich. You know, I, I mean, one year is not enough, right, to, to really um, delve into all the issues that we face day to day. Um, but um, wanting to organize it around um, the kind of the areas that this book is organized around, right, trying to get pregnant, trying not to get to become pregnant, and then kind of the pregnancy experience. And so um, I had the, the great privilege of bringing that series into being. And um, along with, with putting that together, um, we discussed putting together this book. So invited many of the speakers of that series to contribute um, an, an essay or a chapter. Um, there are certain topics that weren't necessarily covered or if some speakers weren't able to commit to, to writing, um, we invited additional people in our field. And so that was really kind of the impetus for putting this book together. Dr. Watson, I noticed also in the introduction that you note that your grandmothers were both nurses. You say, for my grandmothers, both nurses for modeling women at work and caring for others as professions. So this really started for you at a very early age. I think it's interesting as we age, we might look back and recognize influences that we couldn't have named at the time. I think in my grandmother's era, just the fact that they worked um, was not as common, um, but they both, one was a school nurse and one was a hospital nurse and her husband was a doctor. He died when I was very young. So I didn't know my grandfather on that side, but um, they had a practice. They had an eight bed hospital together in Texas. They were the sole physician and nurse on an island off Virginia called Tangier Island. Um, and then when he died prematurely, uh, she became a hospital nurse for, I think, almost 30 years. And I've actually, my sister and I have established a residency scholarship for nurses learning abortion care because she was very committed to reproductive, just everybody's rights and freedoms and the entitlement to medical care. She grew up, this grandmother, uh, one of nine siblings in Appalachia. She was an actual coal miner's daughter, first one in her family to get um, education after high school. So um, my parents are both PhDs um, in social sciences, um, anthropology and psychology, but I think that combination of coming from an academic family, but that model, as Julie said, of finding work that where you can be who you are 24-7, and it's, it's part of your commitments to service and compassion and caring, and it's also intellectually interesting, and you have a contribution to make, and it challenges you. So I, I'm really... Um, always so attentive to nurses. When we talk about clinicians, um, we don't have a nursing school at Northwestern. I wish we did. Um, and so thinking of teen medicine and the capacities and, and in terms of access to medicine too, the incredible role. And in REI, you know, those uh, advanced practice nurses are the patients often primary or very important emotional connection and, and shepherd through the process. So yeah, they, they helped me really invest in teen medicine and, and um, think about hospital medicine as a very young girl, though I wasn't aware of its impact on me probably until later. The, the, the book is divided into three sections, alluding to this earlier. Uh, section one is contraception and abortion ethics, preventing pregnancy and birth. Section two is assisted reproduction ethics initiating the pregnancy and then section three is obstetric ethics managing pregnancy and delivery it, it covers so much i'm just curious were there topics that you wanted to get into the book that did not happen sure by definition you know <laughs> uh, when i wrote my i wrote a book called scarlet a on abortion issues and someone, I wish I remembered who it was so I could credit them, gave me the best advice I've ever received that the only way to finish a book is to keep repeating to yourself, it's not everything I know, it's not the last thing I'll ever write. It's not everything I know, it's not the last thing I'll ever write. Otherwise, it never gets out the door. So I think that's true in a collection also. You have to say it can't be a thousand pages long. So I, you know, for me, the, the trend towards egg freezing for future fertility with healthy young women, I think is tremendously important and rich and complex area that if we did a sequel, uh, I would definitely want to uh, have someone explore the sort of what I think of as the ethics of trying 
And not to disparage anything in the field of REI, but focusing on the not successful patients. We don't talk about them um, who come and receive services and often pay large amounts of money and don't have a baby at the end of the process. And just thinking about that, I'm also really interested in um, gynecological surgery ethics, uh, which wasn't part of the lecture series, but um, another collaborator, uh, Dr. Louise King and I, uh, Dr. King's at Harvard, and we wrote a piece on sex discrimination in the billing for gynecological services versus urological uh, surgical services. So I'm really interested in the, in the pinking of the field of obstetrics and how that affects um, finances. It's really the only medical specialty with primarily, almost exclusively women patients. Some of our patients don't identify as women, um, but people with uteruses typically. And um, uh, a dominantly female workforce and so my women's right lawyer side comes out when I think about that. Um, so there's there's so many issues. Yes. And I, I will say, um, just piggybacking on kind of the um, the topic of um, egg retrieval and freezing for individuals who are healthy and kind of wanting to anticipate potential delays in fertility. You know, the one of the audiences that we really wanted to tailor this book towards was learners, whether that be medical students, nursing students, social work students, and also residents. And this really is a topic that comes up increasingly amongst residents um, in particular. You know, resident pro residency programs are um, covering this as an expense. Um, so it's really, I think, you know, both topically, but also in terms of the audience that we are thinking about in terms of who we hope to reach with this book. Um, I agree. I think that topic would be a really compelling one to include in uh, part two of the, the collection of <laughs> that coming to being. Um, no, sorry, Katie, you were going to say something. No, no, I was going to say as a little postscript to this, I, I don't know if listeners are aware of this, and I would love to do research to give you numbers, but I'm aware anecdotally at multiple um, OBGYN residency programs, um, residents are given presentations like separate, you know, it's hard to find a time when all the residents can sit together. So it's a big deal when you have a meeting, it seems like they, they are given a presentation to explain their egg freezing benefits. There is no parallel presentation to explain their maternity and paternity leave benefits. And so just as an issue of reproductive justice and equity, in our own fields, are we pushing people to delay childbearing or what's the informal curriculum there, even if the message is accidental, to say being a physician and being a mother are incompatible. Um, that can't be true. That can't be right. But in if in our own field of OBGYN, we are not encouraging the practices, whether it's extended breastfeeding or maternity leave of an appropriate length, a healthy length, if we're not encouraging supporting the practices that we tell our patients to do, um, I think that we need some self-reflection there and some change. Uh, anecdotally, I remember when I was a resident, actually in OBGYN, um, uh, one of some, a and attending, I'll, I'll just put that, um, said at some point in my training, I think all residents should undergo egg freezing, <laughs> which, you know, I think definitely set the tone exactly as you're saying. But just thinking about additional, just to answer your, your question about additional topics, I think two others that, that came to mind when you um, kind of asked that were um, harm reduction in obstetric care. Um, you know, I don't think we get into that really. And things like what is the role of healthcare providers, for example, for people who are planning home births? Um, you know, what is our role in terms of harm reduction and, and trying to help, even if a, a, an individual is choosing a path that may not be what we would recommend medically? Um, you know, what is our role and, and responsibility um, in trying to assure that? Nonetheless, that path is done in, in as safe a, a manner as possible. And there's been some great writing on that. But I, you know, I think that that's something that would be compelling. Um, and then the other topic that, you know, is something that I find fascinating, even though the, the actual prevalence of this is not very high, but um, uterine transplantation, I think to me is a topic that I could go on and on about. Um, again, not because it's something that is happening a lot, but I think it 
brings up so many important issues, including from a justice perspective, it's a ton of resources being put into one surgery for one individual. And I, I have compassion for the, the people who are undergoing those surgeries. And I'm, I by no means want to, um, uh, you know, um, diminish like the value um, for that individual of experiencing pregnancy and, and being able to potentially have that um, as, as something that they are able to, to undergo after surgery. But to me, it's a lot of resources put into one individual and thinking about if you took all of those resources and put them into, for example, in, uh, IVF, right? How many more individuals could you help achieve pregnancy? And so for me, um, you know, there are a lot of questions also about kind of you know, the risks of surgery and, and, and is it the drive to kind of push the boundaries of what we can do technically? And, you know, so there are a lot of issues um, around this topic, but to me, kind of the issue of justice and whose fertility and whose, um, uh, uh, you know, childbearing are we valuing over others and where, where should resources go? So to me, that's a very compelling topic. Again, not because it's so common, but I think it really gets into a lot of kind of bigger, bigger issues. So those are things that to me, I I would love to explore further. What then would you both like for learners, residents? We can also see this as a chance for professional development for people who've already been in the field for many years. What would you like them to walk away with after reading this? I mean, we could, we could probably tag team on this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, the goal of, of this book was to try to, to present to the reader, number one, a, a framework. So in our introduction, we try to present a framework of kind of how to approach clinically challenging circumstances. You know, I do a lot of ethics consultations at the University of Chicago, and I teach ethics just as, as Katie does as well at Northwestern. And um, when I meet with students and fellows and talk about ethics consults, I think I tell them, you know, a lot of times these consultations or these kind of scenarios come up when like a team has kind of a, a yucky feeling in their stomach that like something's not quite right. But whereas other consultations that come through to, to us about like, you know, heavy vaginal bleeding, you know, can you please like, what is the, you know, why is this patient experiencing this and how can, how can we um, help her with, you know, so that, that would be a consultation that we get as a gynecologist. When you get an ethics consultation, generally it's like a, a narrative as opposed to a question. And I think that for a lot of people, it's hard to crystallize. What is that question? What is actually the, the crux of the scenario that makes it ethically challenging or ethically questionable. And so, um, you know, I I tell students and and other learners to kind of just fall back on what you learned in like your like med school ethics course. You know, I think the four kind of core ethical principles that we learn, and obviously there are more than just four, but, you know, it's a, a good framework to be thinking about kind of you know, thinking about justice, thinking about autonomy, beneficence, and, and non-maleficence. And oftentimes these scenarios come about when two or more of these principles are in tension. And so just kind of thinking about how the, these, these principles are in tension and, and, you know, kind of that helps you really kind of, again, synthesize like a question, what is exactly going on? So, so that is um, one thing that, we were hoping to achieve in terms of giving a framework for readers, um, especially in the introduction, and then giving readers digestible chapters that weren't exhaustive, but, you know, highlight kind of some some key scenarios or or, um, issues that come up in our field and trying to make them um, clinically relevant. And so to to give the reader some like opportunities for self-reflection, some thinking questions, thought questions of when you're faced with similar scenarios, kind of how to think through this. But really, I think we were hoping to make this rather practical for readers. For me, I think helping clinicians contextualize their work on the reproductive justice continuum was really important as a framing device. And so sometimes when we talk about principalism, justice is referred to as the neglected principle, or it's only applied to like 
resource allocation or COVID and ventilators or vaccines. Um, but I think when we expand beyond the physician patient dyad and think of social justice, it makes our ethics analysis so much richer, makes our ethics analysis so much richer. And um, the reproductive justice continuum talks about the right to uh, not have a child, the right to have a child, and of course, to parent the children that you have with safety and dignity. We don't get into the parent, the child you have, but I think when we think about that continuum, um, the idea that over 60% of ART patients are over 35, how do they reach that age without children or without the uh, full complement of children they wanted? Well, they were using contraception and abortion. Um, And then when they are successful with their REI, what happens? They deliver a baby and they become the obstetrics patient. So understanding your patient isn't, quote, just the REI patient. She or they is the family planning patient and they are the obstetrics patient. And so understanding that um, or just being aware, everyone understands it, but just bringing that to the forefront, the continuity of care and the idea that you you have a stake in these other fields of obstetrics, these other specialties, rather, that that's important to understand in terms of life course for your patient. You're seeing her or them at a particular moment but they have been seeing other physicians potentially, hopefully, um, during their life course. And the second piece of that reproductive justice focus brings a light to issues of access and resources. And these are both racial and economic, sometimes overlapping, sometimes not. Because in ethics consultation or classic clinical ethics, we think of that physician-patient dyad. But the who's excluded from that is everyone who doesn't have the privilege of calling themselves patient who didn't make it in the door. And so expanding that vision to think about who's not here, who should or could be and wants to be, um, I think is that reproductive justice lens helps us think about. And so there's a, a essay I just love by a physician scholar named Lisa Harris in the book, thinking about access to IVF resources and the vision of how, how we went historically and culturally to this idea that that's for rich white professional women and how women of color don't have equal access. We're thinking about the fact that Medicaid doesn't cover access to REI services, what that says about who's entitled to parent and whose motherhood matters. And so that reproductive justice lens expands and enriches our vision. So I think for, it's so easy in clinical practice, I'm very sympathetic that the the trees are so immediate and you hit them so hard uh, that you have to focus on them every day. And a collection like this helps you step back and think about the forest, which for clinicians, sometimes is a luxury, but I would say is a necessity to stay grounded and keep your big picture vision as you do your granular high impact individual work every day and keeping that in a creative balance, I think is a gift. I know as a, they always say like the teachers learn more than the students. And that's one of the gifts of being an educator. Um, So I I have a fantasy that clinicians will use this book as much as learners or those who are guiding residents and students as they work through the book will learn as much and enjoy that um, the richness of that that stepping back and thinking about the forest and what that spirit brings to your day to day patient care and honoring those day to day I call them the bread and butter ethics issues not just the neon light ethics issues of like oh my gosh shock tablets or whatever it's sort of like what do you really see every day and realizing just how important those decisions are. And what a wonderful collection this is. And oh man, access to care. We could, whew, that's, that's a much lengthier conversation. <laughs> volume and, three. <laughs> that's volume three. There you go. See, you're already pitching volume three. <laughs> um, I was going to say we're almost out of time. So Professor Watson, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your upcoming ASRM webinar in May? Yes. The mental health uh, interest group, subgroup of ASRM asked me to present a webinar on the landscape of abortion care. So there's so much change up both current and upcoming in abortion law, which is my uh, area of scholarship and my specialty. And so I'm going to talk about that, but also how it might impact the patients that REI uh, specialists and psychologists will be seeing in terms of personhood uh, initiatives and embryonic status. So it's, it's, 
in that RJ um, spirit, it's a understanding what's going on in abortion law. Since in REI, the claim to a legal right to procreate is really piggybacked on all the abortion law. And so understanding the relationship is the topic of the webinar and how it could affect uh, medical practice going forward. And we will link to that webinar in our show notes for anyone that wants to attend in May. And I'm going to assume we'll probably, ASRM usually has a pretty good habit of posting those afterwards too. So we'll make sure that that link stays active afterwards. My guests today have been Dr. Julie Kaur and Professor Katie Watson. They have edited this book. It is wonderful. Reproductive Ethics in Clinical Practice, Preventing, Initiating, and Managing Pregnancy and delivery. It is available everywhere you get your books these days. Professor Watson, Dr. Kaur, thank you so much for coming on on the book review. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. And I'll add one last note, which is we were very adamant to have this in paperback as well as hardback. So don't be fooled. There's a very expensive hardback and there's a very affordable paperback. (laughs) This is true. And speaking of access, Speaking of access, it, it, it abs- absolutely. You can subscribe and rate the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever it is that you listen to your downloads. I am Jeffrey Hayes, and this is the ASRM Today Book Review. This concludes this episode of ASRM Today. For show notes, author information, and discussions, go to asrmtoday.org. This material is copyrighted by the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and may not be reproduced or used without express consent from ASRM. ASRM Today Series podcasts are supported in part by the ASRM Corporate Member Council. The information and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of ASRM and its affiliates. These are provided as a source of general information and are not a substitute for consultation with a physician.